Welcome to Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood, a podcast that's all about changing the way we view midlife and bringing the conversation about menopause out into the open. Each week we share stories, experiences and inspiration. We talk to experts on how to best navigate this time of life and find out how other people have not only survived but thrived through this time. I'm your host, Karen O'Connor. Hello and welcome to today's episode. Today I'm with James Jensen. James is the managing director and co-owner of the Australian Nutrition Centre. He holds a bachelor degree in pharmacy and is currently studying a master's in human nutrition. He is a functional medicine practitioner and integrative pharmacist. And James is passionate about treating the root cause of symptoms through natural therapy for a range of health issues, including diabetes, hormone health, anxiety, fertility, weight loss, and children's behavioral management. Welcome, James. Oh, thank you. Or I should say welcome back. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's good to be back. I thought I'd get you on today because it's the start of the new year and there's quite possibly a lot of us have overindulged over the Christmas season. And then we've gone on generally as a result of the overindulgence that's happened over Christmas to make all these New Year's resolutions that don't seem to stick around for very long. So I wanted to talk to you about those two things, how to overcome the overindulgence and then also how to move along with New Year's resolutions so we don't drop them after a week. They're always the most expensive gym memberships, aren't they? Those yes, ones you make absolutely. On the 1st of Jan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose um, I think it, it can often begin with setting your intentions and making sure you're really, I guess, clear about what it is that you want to achieve. So a lot of people will come and visit me in the clinic and they'll say, hey, James, I want to lose weight. You know, I've been overindulging. I want to lose weight. And I'll say, well, why do you want to lose weight? And they'll often look at me sort of with this blank stare like it's obvious, like, well, of course I just want to lose weight. And I'll say, well, why? They might say, oh, it's to be healthy. And I say, okay, well, what will being healthier get you to do? And we sort of keep asking these to get to the why, to get to the real root reason or or driver or motivator for them. And then I think once you sort of come to that realisation of what it is that's really motivating you to, to want to be healthier or wanting to lose weight, it makes it easier to sort of look back upon that. So for some people, it might be, look, you know, when I play with my children, I find that I'm getting tired or I'm unable to keep up and that really upsets me. So when you're sort of trying to stick to, to a new plan or, or a new way of life, if you've got that really clear understanding of why it is that you're wanting to do it, um, I think it makes it a lot easier to stick to it, especially when the going gets tough. Just being healthy isn't always the best motivator, even though it should be, but it's it's not. So I think setting your intentions clearly is a really good place to start. And 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 then I think understanding why people have certain behaviours. So, for example, I mean, most of us will do the wrong thing with our food or, or diet or exercise and things like that because we're tired. So often I'll, rather than put people straight away on this perfect eating meal plan or something like that, I'll I'll try and work out some of the areas of their life that, that might be contributing to, to poorer behaviours or habits. You know, for example, if you're stressed or anxious, you know, you're more likely to want to drink. You know, if you're stressed or anxious, you're more likely to want to eat junk food. And You know, so if we go, well, okay, maybe we need to deal with the stress and anxiety because I know that if you can deal with that, you'll be able to to better handle some of the, the, the things that, you know, when the going gets tough and you're wanting to, to eat better and, you know, if, it, if it's about prioritising sleep, if we do that, you know, obviously that's that sets the, the mood and, and sets sets the sort of the way forward to get it sort of in line. It's interesting that you're saying those things because going back a couple of steps to what you were saying about having the intention and what the intention is behind it when you want to exercise or eat healthy. I know personally I've trained at swimming reasonably high level my entire life Mm. and I'm also a swimming coach. I'm a high-level swimming coach. Do you think I can train myself? Not a hope in hell. Like, it'll last for about two weeks now. I'm like, oh, bored. I'll just drop out after so many laps because I don't want to do it. But if I've got a trainer there on my back, it makes all the difference. And the other thing that makes a difference is having an end goal. So I want to compete in that race or I want to be able to do X, Y, Z. 
within so many months. That's the only reason that'll make me stick at it and it'll make me get over that little hump of not wanting to do it or not wanting to go. So that's really interesting that you said that. And I'm I'm going to hook back to you because I've forgotten what the second bit was. So, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I guess we we're um, we we're sort of just talking about, I suppose, understanding and learning some of the things that get in the way of you, you know, being healthy in the first place and, you know, whether it be sleep or stress or, or whatever it is. Yeah. I, I, what I noticed as well is, you know, where you see there's that classic thing of there's people in the movies and they're watching a horror film and they're just shoveling the popcorn into their mouth, you know, it's going everywhere. I find I do that. If I'm watching something, a drama or a suspense thing on telly, I just I just eat. <laughs> like I've yes. got something in my mouth. <laughs> yes. One of the mechanisms that's um, sort of related to that is so when we're stressed, um, obviously the first sort of, you know, if you're if you nearly get hit by a car, for example, or something frightens you, you get that first surge of adrenaline, and then following that is cortisol. And cortisol's a stress hormone, well, it's actually an anti-stress hormone in many ways. But that stress hormone, if it's out for too long or too prolonged, that can drive a lot of, you know, sugar and salt cravings. Um, So one of the mechanisms that our body will use to try and bring cortisol down is eating. So insulin actually, um, so insulin is secreted when your body um, or when you eat as part of a storage process. So your body knows that insulin and and uh, cortisol oppose each other. So it's not so surprising that when people are stressed, you know, they can stress eat. Sometimes when it's really, really high, that's when you, you know, you guess you kind of see two types of people. You see people that don't eat at all. They're just so stressed they can't eat. And I would say that's probably a more heightened state, whereas that more base chronic, you know, not tearing your hair out, but just feeling at, you know, unease. Um, They're the people that sort of tend to eat, you know, comfort eat. And part of that is driven through that, sort of insulin cortisol mechanism where your body's trying to get that cortisol down. Um, so maybe there's something in that, you know, maybe the, the movies you're watching or, or something like that, they've got you, they've got you hooked and, and um, making the popcorn. Yeah. It's really fascinating. How do you train yourself to notice when you're doing that? Yeah. Well, I suppose it's, it's all about the, uh, you know, the understanding. So you know, it comes back to basics like mindfulness. But if you understand that mechanism, for example, next time you watch a movie and you start going, actually, I've been, you know, I've gone five mouthfuls of, of popcorn in the last sort of 30 seconds, you know, you might go, well, hang on, maybe that's to do with that mechanism that James is telling me about. Oh, actually, this movie is quite stressful or, you know, it is gripping and, it, and you know, maybe it's, I think firstly, like any sort of bad behavior or anything that you want to change, if you understand how it happens, um, it makes it easier. And then the more often you recognize it, the more easy it is to to counteract it. But I think understanding means you can identify it and then once you identify it, you can overcome it. Yeah, I found one of the most difficult things was keeping a food diary because then I got really present to just what I ate because it's those... I saw a meme the other day that said um, dietitians say that the uh, a serving of chips is 10 chips, but I eat that many when I'm standing in the cupboard deciding whether to eat any chips. <laughs> it's dead true, isn't it? You stand yeah. there with the, with the packet open, just eating the chips, deciding whether you want any. Yeah, there's like that element of mindless eating, but you know, it's a bit like a, maybe that gambler's mentality. You you only remember the wins or you only talk about the wins that you have. And when we um, often talk to people about their food, they often rattle off all these amazing things. And I said, well, you just told me earlier that you don't eat very well. And they said, oh, yes, well, I suppose if I think about, you know, and it's just, it's those little things that we sneak in that maybe we don't even consider as food. And even um, drinks, for example, some people don't, include them in their food so you know if you're having like a you know a nice coffee full of milk and sugar people go well that's not food that's just a drink you know so it just depends you know it comes back to that that understanding of nutrition and food and and you know what exactly constitutes um nutrients talk to me about cortisol and stress levels and all those kind of things because a lot of us over the Christmas holidays, you know, we got people coming to stay and then we got the big family dinners, which can quite often end up doing what family dinners do. And 
all the stress of getting the presents and everything. And at, at the moment in Australia, it's even worse because we haven't seen our families if they live interstate and you got, are they going to get home for Christmas and all that kind of thing going on. Talk to me about that, about the impact that it has, but also how we can counteract it as well. Yeah, sure. So I, I guess, you know, as you mentioned earlier, cortisol it will come out after sort of like an acute stress, but cortisol is normal and it's very helpful. But if it's prolonged, that's where it becomes an issue. So we're not meant to be staying in stressful situations. So often when you're talking about the scenarios, some of us have have been under sort of chronic stress, even if, you know, not not even COVID related, but, you know, even you think about with with work and, and parenting and all the things that we have to deal with. If you stay in a state of constant stress and you see that elevated cortisol, it changes the way your, your hormones signal. It changes the way, you know, we look at food. It changes the way our bodies handle food. For example, cortisol makes you less sensitive to insulin. And what that means is when you're eating food or carbohydrates, you tend to store more of those carbohydrates and calories as fat. So you'll, you'll always see like the traditional cortisol body shape. I say it's like a, an, an egg on legs. So you imagine cortisol stores a lot of central adiposity. So weight gain all around the middle. And if it's really, really chronic, you can see like skinny arms and skinny legs. So I, I sometimes say, you look at all our politicians, they've all got cortisol issues, but you know, long hours and, and lots of stress and you know, skinny arms, skinny legs and big bellies. That's definitely, you know, to do with cortisol. And some of the things that we can do to counteract that the, there are basics like, you know, obviously being mindful and meditation. And but sometimes, you know, in the middle of a, a family dinner, you know, if there's a bit of fighting or whatever, it's, it's not so easy to just go, excuse me, we'll just hold that thought. Well, I'm just going to have a 15 minute meditation. But from a, from a clinic point of view, we'll often prescribe basics like, you know, your zinc, magnesium, B vitamins, because they give the, the body's ability to switch on and off. And, Magnesium, I say to people, often, you know, I'll say, oh, look, I think you'll benefit from magnesium. And they say, oh, won't that make me tired? I'm looking for energy. And I'll say, well, it won't do that. And they say, well, don't people take magnesium for energy? I want to switch off. And I said, well, what magnesium does is it's like giving you the switch. So it can enable you to switch on and switch off. So it helps you adapt to what you need. So people use magnesium for energy and for sleep. So magnesium is a really good basic to help modulate cortisol. Um, your adrenals, which produce the cortisol, they rely on things like um, B vitamins as well. So uh, often I'll use the analogy like uh, your adrenal system is like a cup. And if your cup's empty, you don't have any energy. So people that are chronically stressed often end up with a overflowing cup. So things like magnesium can help fill that cup up. B vitamins can help fill that cup up. We also look at adaptogen herbs. So they're herbs that help modulate the way the adrenals work. So things like Shasandra, Rhodiola, and Methania are common ones that people would know. Maybe not know the botanical names, but they may have heard of adaptogen herbs. And what they do is, I, I say, it makes the cup bigger, and it also puts a lid on the cup. So you can open and close the cup and drink from the cup when you need to. So someone that's chronically stressed, if you use some of these herbs and nutrients, it enables your body the ability to switch off when it requires. And then when you need energy to be up and about and do things, you know, you can certainly drink from that cup and there will be hopefully some fuel there. And so I've just found out that I'm marginally insulin resistant, which is probably the result of chronic stress over a prolonged period of time. And yes. the other thing that the nutritionist said was that my vagus nerve, it's either on or it's off. There's no in between. And it's really untoned, I think, was the term she used. Can you explain a little bit about that? Because I think this is something that a lot of people my age are going to suddenly find out. I mean, the nutritionist said, you're a skinny diabetic, <laughs> basically. I'm just yes. lucky I don't have a sweet tooth. And I think some of it's got to do with menopause or, or menstruating has protected me for a long time. And now I've hit menopause, I haven't got that protection. But there's a whole, whole heap of things underneath that, isn't there? Because this is something that I didn't ever consider. I mean, I'm slim. Size eight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I guess um, it's a combination of things. So, well, certainly 
like you've rightly pointed out, going through menopause or being menopausal. I mean, the first part of menopause is usually high estrogen and estrogen sensitizes you to insulin. So if you're insulin resistant, obviously that's the opposite to sensitive to insulin. When you go through menopause and you no longer have that high estrogen, your body automatically becomes less sensitive or more insulin resistant. So that's through no fault of your own. You know, that's just a normal course um, that everybody becomes more insulin resistant once that estrogen is gone. And as you rightly pointed out about, you know, if we add, if we add in the, the effects of stress. Um, so the vagus nerve, it's a, a very important nerve. It, it innovates basically from the brain all the way through to lungs, kidneys, adrenals. It, it, it's, you know, the heart, it's connected to everything. So if you're in that sympathetic punch and run, you often, the, you know, the vagus nerve can switch off where, you know, rest and digest parasympathetic allows the vagus nerve to be um, more active. So digestion is a, you know, the vagus nerve has to be um, activated for that. When we look at high levels of stress, so all that stress can switch off the vagus nerve. So if you've got lots of cortisol from being chronically stressed all the time, or even if you're not stressed, even if you're just busy, like if people are just doing lots all the time, I just say stress is just the, you know, however you look at it, it's the opposite of being relaxed. So sometimes I'll say to people, are you stressed? And they'll say, no. I'll say, well, do you have trouble feeling relaxed? And they go, oh, yeah, I do actually. So for me, it's a, it's the same thing. So all that chronic stress, however you look at it, can block vagus nerve activity. All that cortisol, like I said before, will also make you more resistant to insulin. So it's not surprising, you know, there's lots of factors which contribute to insulin resistance. But probably for you, if we look at, you know, maybe the lack of estrogen combined with chronic stress, yes, you can become more insulin resistant. And then, um, like you said, you're lucky you don't have a sweet tooth because insulin resistance plus sugar and carbohydrates makes for people not being size eight. Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky in that I don't have a sweet tooth, but where it's gone for me is chips. I need chips all the time. <laughs> literally sit down and eat a big bag of chips yeah. and I have to just not it's really difficult so I'm can't, I'm almost hungry all the time yes yeah you can you can sometimes you know the saying is overfed undernourished mm. but again it could be you know if it, it could be the salt that you're looking for and salt can you know often if someone is a bit burnt out for example if they're looking for salt or they crave a lot of savory you know we consider that the adrenals might be something that's worth working on so for you, you know, based on the example you've given, if it is, I mean, the answer is to not give you more estrogen. Um, the answer would maybe be to look at adrenals and look at maybe some of those stress response. And that will probably bring your fasting insulin down and make you more uh, insulin sensitive. Ah, okay. Something you said then just triggered a memory with me because you were saying putting more estrogen in your body isn't the answer. There is... And I'm, this is nothing against HRT. I think HRT has got a fabulous place. But I was talking to somebody the other week and they were saying that they were at a medical conference and they were in like a breakout group and there were some doctors that were suggesting that they should put all women on HRT and estrogen supplements so that they didn't experience menopause because it was a bit of a problem as opposed to let's find out how this works and how we can actually ease the transition from menstruating to not menstruating, which is quite an interesting way of looking at things, isn't it? It's seen as being a problem of something wrong as opposed to something that's naturally going to happen. Yeah, it really has to be case by case. I mean, there are, there are a few occasions where I, w- where I would recommend HRT, you know, for example, if you're going through a midlife crisis and you're, there's a lot of stress, maybe it's, it's, it's worth taking just to park, park one thing away and go, well, look, I'll deal with that a little bit later. It depends on dose and things like that and the individual cause, but to, to in part make a bit of a full circle. Once your uh, ovaries stop making the hormone or lose the ability to make the hormone, it's your adrenals that actually make up some of that gap. So the more stressed and the more burnt out you are, the less ability your adrenals have to make some of that hormone or, or, f- or fill some of that gap that the ovaries have created. 
So again, sometimes managing menopause is more about managing the adrenals than it is about the sex hormones. So some people may not need HRT and it's just simply about looking at the adrenal system might be the better way. A a lot of the older style HRT medications were a synthetic and I think that was more problematic than some of the, well, now there seems to be a bit of a shift back to using more of the natural ones, um, which I think is better. Um, and even something like estradiol, you know, the Sandrina gel, which is available in Australia, that's a gel. So you can, you can tailor the dose. So you can put on, you know, half a sachet or a quarter of a sachet. So you can sort of give your body that gentle wean down of, of hormone if required. Um, and that just makes that transition a little bit more stable, a little bit more gentle. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose I've never thought about it in that way before, that because you're not producing the estrogen and your adrenals have got to take over, if they're already exhausted because you're living on the edge, then the only way to go is down. You're just going to crash, aren't you? You crash and burn. Yes, yeah. And that's where I, I think a lot of the times managing stress and, you know, that we always say stress is the root of all evil, but I have lots of things that I say is the root of all evil. But um, managing stress, I think, becomes particularly important. And, you know, if you think about the time of life for for women when they are, you know, basically anywhere from 35 onwards, you could look at perimenopause or menopause. And that's often where they're quite busy with careers and, and things like that as well. So you can see our, our chronic, crazy, busy lives that we live um, lends to not, not so pleasant menopause. Yeah, you can. And where does your digestion come into this? Well, you know, chronic stress, as we said, can switch off the vagus nerve and then that can lead to poorer digestion. And then to create that vicious loop, um, the vagus nerve is in particular um, responsible for allowing you to produce digestive enzymes. So if you're lots of stress, you know, so sometimes people, oh, I feel like I've swallowed a rock. So that's an indication of the digestive tract itself not engaging digestion. So you're not producing digestive enzymes from chronic stress. That means you don't break down food. That means you're not getting the nutrients out of your food. The nutrients from your food are the things that help you adapt and regulate stress. And then all of a sudden it creates that vicious loop. To add hormones in the mix, a lot of your hormones are detoxified from your gut as well. So if your digestive system isn't working properly, you can't detoxify the proper hormones. We're continually exposed to lots of endocrine disrupting chemicals, you know, pesticides, things like that. So if our gut's not working properly, we're not getting rid of some of those chemicals, which lay, you know, leads to more pressure on our endocrine system. So sex hormones. And then you, know, you can see how all of a sudden it's like, gosh, I can't catch a break, getting it every which way. And also remembering that, you know, that we talk about gut being the second brain. If your gut is inflamed, if it's, you know, under stress, you will feel more stressed as well. And, you know, that can lead to, to more cortisol, you know, which can only amplify some of the stress you know, reactions that we're already talking about. And, and again, poor detoxification of sex hormones and your sex hormones can hijack your brain and make you feel more stressed, switch your gut off, and it just creates this vicious loop. And that's why sometimes I get in and go, well, look, there's a lot going on, but if we can just break the cycle, all the other things will fall back into place. What would be the first thing you'd do to break the cycle? I usually try and take a, a detailed case history and I, and I try and work out what happened first. Um, for example, if someone says, oh, look, I just, I was busy, 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 stress, stress, stress. And then I noticed that my hormones were out of whack and then my digestion became out of whack. So then I'll go, okay, well, stress is the root of all evil here. You know, they might say, I was cruising along great. And then all of a sudden I started to go through menopause or I started to, you know, my, my gut started playing up and then I started getting more stressed about it. And then my, you know, my sex hormones went out of whack. So I'll try and work out what it is. There is also a fair bit of merit in, in, in listening to Hippocrates. You know, the, he famously said all disease begins in the gut and, you know, that's not a bad place to start as well. But, you know, again, you could go, well, my gut's not working properly, but is it not working properly because of my stress? So. Usually I'll always start with stress and gut before sex hormones. Yeah, I I can see that. Where does salt come into all of this? Because you were saying if I'm craving salt, then to take more salt. Where does that, and is this, this is obviously a common thing, not getting enough of the right salts, is it? Or what is it? Yeah, well, I think um, salt was vilified. You know, if we put salt in our food, we're all going to die of heart disease. 
I see a lot of people that are um, really scared of salt. There's, there's a couple of things. Um, sometimes I look at uh, salt cravings in particular as people looking for iodine. So one of our normal sort of sources of iodine for the body would be salt, so iodized salt, whereas a lot of people now will use Himalayan salt, which is lower in, in iodine. So Himalayans, uh, Himalayas are mountains, which is not the ocean, obviously, so very low iodine content compared to iodized salt. So sometimes it's the, the thyroid screaming out for a little bit more iodine. The adrenals love so- salt as well and sodium. So it, it again, it depends on case by case, but I'll, I'll often encourage people to, to look at, you know, and understand what their cravings are and what, what is that a signal of. You know, sometimes people that just crave chronic sugar, it could be stress or it could be that they have got bugs in their gut that just love sugar and want it. And these bugs are really clever and they can signal to the brain and, and tell you to eat more sugar as well. So it just depends. Some people, they'll say, I just can't help but eat sugar. And they'll either go, but it makes me feel sick, but I love it. You know, so, mm. What kind of bugs would you have in your stomach? Are you just talking about the wrong bacteria, like a candida kind of thing? Yeah, candida. Yep, candida is like a fungus. They they obviously love sugar. Um, that's their preferred source, but they're very clever. They'll eat anything. They're quite resilient. You'll see people, I think in the, in the probably late 80s, early 90s, it was a bit of a one-size-fits-all solution from naturopaths where, you know, everybody had candida, which there's probably a bit of truth in that. But um, if you just simply avoid sugar, the candida will, will start eating something else. But, you know, sugar is their favourite thing. So they'll, they'll always lean, lean, like lean you towards that. Like overindulging at Christmas and other holidays, does that increase the light? How do you get candida? Where's it come from? So it's, it's naturally occurring, so we've all got it, right? But if we eat lots and lots of sugar, obviously if you're feeding, you know, it's a bit like, um, you know, a lawn, if you keep putting fertiliser on, you're going to get more and more grass or faster growing grass. Um, if you've got an overgrowth, so obviously if you're feeding more and more sugar and that's their preferred source of fuel, they will outgrow some of the bacteria that might eat more fibres, for example, so like plant-based fibres. So we've all got it, but people that just eat lots and lots of sugar, if their bacteria um, aren't able to um, sort of, you know, think of it like the, you know, the old Inner Health Plus ad where you've got that good bacteria and bad bacteria and you've got like that tug of war and that army sort of fight. But eventually one can win and if you keep fueling the, the wrong army, that's where, where things can get out of, out of whack. Again, the use of antibiotics. So antibiotics, they kill bacteria, not fungus. Um, So you can see that, you know, if you're using a course of antibiotics and you happen to eat sugar at the same time that you're eating, uh, that you're having the antibiotics, you're killing off the competition and then you're feeding the the guys that are, that are going to take over. So you can set yourself up for, for an issue there. And, and um, so there's lots of ways it can happen, but usually through some poor life choices. And, and even just to talk about stress again, you know, we talked about the vagus nerve helping you engage digestion. Well, if you're not producing enough digestive enzymes, you're not sterilizing that top part of your gut properly. So digestive enzymes, I'd say to people, it's like hosing out your driveway. If you don't hose your driveway properly, you don't cleanse that top half of that small intestine, and that can lead to overgrowth as well. How do you tone the vagus nerve? Well, it's, it, I guess it comes back to all the basics, like uh, making sure we've got a, the right nutrients to help support the adrenal system, you know, looking at stress modification techniques so you know sleeping properly you know not overusing stimulants you know meditation all the basics that we i guess um we we're told are good for us to manage stress are really really important some people even benefit from uh there's different therapies that you know they call like vagal nerve stimulation so i'm not an expert in those but i know that there's there's even some therapies where They'll insert electrodes uh, into the vagus nerve and they will stimulate the vagus nerve that way. Um, It's a common treatment for depression, actually. Well, not a common. It's an uncommon uh, treatment for depression, but quite an effective one. Mm. Wow. I didn't know that. It sounds really painful, actually, having electrodes attached to a nerve. (laughs) Yeah. It's particularly reserved for those who are really, really resistant to all sorts of treatment. You know, you think of like the worst of the worst who just, really cannot get out of their own way 
that's where you sort of resort, resort to that. But obviously the vagus nerve is non-specific. So we talked about all the things that it innovates to. So if you're stimulating the vagus nerve, you're going to get some side effects, but, you know, people report feeling much, much better. So, you know, it's one of those, it's not a perfect treatment, but it, I guess it lends to, to understanding just how important it is. So let's go back to where we started because we were talking about, okay, starting the new year and we've talked for a long time about repairing your body from the overindulgence, which we've probably all done right now. And yes. but how do we stick at it? What's the best way of doing that? Um, so most of the time I'll start with um, doing a little bit of a gut cleanse with people. So we talked about bad food feeding bad bugs. So if we've overindulged, we've likely, you know, had too much alcohol, we've likely eaten too much sugar and too many processed foods. And basically, you know, the old saying, you are what you eat. So the more of those foods you you eat, the more of those bacteria that you feed. So then you can end up with an overpopulation of bacteria that are used to eating all these dodgy foods. And lo and behold, when you when you start eating better, those dodgy bugs are like, hey, where's our food gone? Where's our Where's our chips? Where's our alcohol? Where's our, you know, our sugar? Where's our Christmas cake? So what we'll often do is we'll combining, you know, whilst we sort of start to to take some of those foods out, we'll also look at, you know, doing some um, some herbs or spices, and we've got a formula called Gut Right, which we use. But basically, it, it poisons and helps clear out some of those those bugs that are responsible for those food cravings. So I find once we get rid of those, you don't have these little guys signaling in your brain saying, hey, you should eat more fruitcake. Or we'll often start with that. Um, and as I said earlier, we try and work out what are the exacerbating factors. So if it is tiredness, we go, well, hey, maybe we need to, to get you to sleep better because we all make bad decisions if we're tired. Again, you know, are we, are we not sleeping well because we're too stressed or is there a problem in our gut? We, we, again, to talk about the gut, um, most of our serotonin is actually made in the gut. So if we've got a gut bug imbalance, we're going to miss that serotonin, but serotonin leads to melatonin production. So melatonin is really important for sleep maintenance. So again, maybe we need to fix our gut to fix our sleep. And, you know, if we're sleeping better, then we're going to wake up more refreshed. We're going to find it easier to not look for, you know, sugar, especially when it comes to two or three o'clock. So I guess that's where holistic medicine and that holistic approach and, and getting a really good case history and looking at all the different factors and, and understanding how they come about makes it easier to sort of get started and then therefore stick to, stick to something. And the, the other thing is too, some people are all or nothing. So if you do slip up, I say, just reset. That's okay. We're not perfect. We just get back on the next day and identifying that, you know, or at least acknowledging that, yes, I wasn't so good this weekend, but that's okay. Monday I'll get back rather than going, oh, all my hard work's out the window. I knew I'm a failure. You know, that, a lot of that comes back to psychology and mindset. But I think, um, yeah, just looking at it holistically makes a huge difference. I think one of the most important points that you've been making the whole way through is that we're all different. Like what applies to me is not going to apply to my best friend or her cousin. We all need to be assessed individually, don't we? It's not as simple as going down to the health food shop or going into Woolies and going to the supplement aisle and going picking a few things out because we actually need to really dig down deep and discover what's going on. And that's the most important thing, I think, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, having that sort of objective third party to sort of make an assessment and sort of work out what you need to do first, um, I think makes a huge difference. I know for, you know, a lot of people when you when you look at advertising and marketing for different products, you know, a lot of people go, oh, that's me, that's me, that's me, this is what I need. But it may not actually be because when you look at the the issues that people have, a lot of them are common depending on, you know, you know no matter what you sort of look at, whether it be a hormone imbalance or, you know, stress or a gut problem, a lot of people have similar issues. So, yeah, I think talking to, to any sort of professional or, or objective sort of third party to, to help work out where you need to start, um, I think makes a huge difference. Yeah, and what made me think about it was my sleep. I've struggled with sleep for 10 years, which, hello, menopause. But 
I've got so many books on sleep and how to get good sleep and good sleep habits and what to eat to get a good sleep. And not one of them made a jot of difference until I did a few weeks ago a full on detox, like it was a blood testing diet that I went on. And, you know, you eat these foods at this time. Not a problem with my sleep. Within three days, I started sleeping. So that to me was a really good sign that what you're saying is completely true. It all came from the gut. It's got nothing to do with my sleep habits. For me personally, for somebody else, it might do. But for me, it was all about my digestive system. Yes. Yeah. And that's why, you know, maybe that that old guy, Hippocrates, is he's pretty clever. With all the modern things that we have and know, it, it always comes back to the basics. And, and you know, you know, maybe it is. I mean, and I firmly believe a lot of it does really begin in the gut. Um, so it's not so surprising to to know that we've already, or, you know, we've already had the answer. Um, it's just about listening to it and and coming back to the basics. So tell me now, because it's time to wrap up. How can people get in touch with you? I'll put all of the links on the web page as well, but you you tell us too. Yeah. Sure. So um, Business is Australian Nutrition Centre. Uh, we have a website, which is australiannutritioncentre.com.au. Um, we've also got all the usual social media. Um, so Facebook and Instagram and my beautiful wife handles our TikTok. If people want to ask a question or if they're not sure how we can help, just send us a message on, on Facebook or, or Instagram. We've also got our uh, contact details on our website. So give us a call and I think we'll We'll, um, we'll always answer and do our best to help you. And this isn't just for Australia, is it? You can talk to people outside Australia? That's right, yeah. We have um, we have people all over the world. I try not to do too many 3 a.m. consultations, but um, I have done in the past, yeah. <laughs> I can imagine that. Good group. Thanks yeah. so much for talking to me again, James. It was fabulous. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Have a lovely weekend. for joining us this week on menopause marriage and motherhood make sure you subscribe to the show on your favorite player and while you're at it we'd love you to leave us a rating on itunes or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show that would be amazing too be sure to tune in next week for the next episode and remember if you're busy thinking about what you can't have how on earth are you going to enjoy what you can have see you next week